Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Part 12. He is playing them now, circling them, watching. He knows their destination and is not concerned. The followers beamed in, tracking them. As they move, the light dot moves with them. The black flower in the girl's hand sends out its message. She's here, here, here. It will lead him to them. He is no longer angry or frustrated. He is sure of his moves, utterly calm. The mice are in the trap. Barrier, 50 miles ahead, the car warned, slowing itself. Barrier, 25 miles ahead, it said. Barrier, 5 miles ahead. Barrier reached. Instructions, please. Logan and Jess sent the car back down a tunnel. We walk from here, he told her. Ahead of them, the maze was blocked by a caved-in se section of rock. Part of the tunnel ceiling had collapsed, choking the area with mud and rubble. They managed to skirt the obstruction by using a narrow walkway, which led them eventually to an abandoned platform. Stanton Square. The air was moist and cloying and smelled of rot. Thick vines looped themselves across the stairway, which led up to the street. At the bottom of the root-clogged landing, Logan stopped short, drew in a quick breath. Boot prints. One set. Leading up. Francis must have arrived here ahead of them. He must be waiting up there for us, thought Logan, the gun gripped tightly in his hand, waiting to kill us. The first engagement in the Little War took place at 15th and K Street, in front of the Sheraton Bar and Grill in the heart of Washington. For over a month, young people had been pouring into the city, massing for a huge demonstration to protest the 39th Amendment to the Constitution. Like other prohibitions before it, this Compulsory Birth Control Act was impossible to enforce, and the youth had taken the stand that it was a direct infringement of their rights. Bitter resentment was directed against the two arms of government dual enforcement, the National Council of Eugenics, and the Federal Birth Study Commission. Washington had no business regulating the number of children a citizen could have. Bitterness turned to talk of rebellion. Several test cases of the new law before the Supreme Court had failed to advance the cause of the youthful rebels. Anger swept the ranks of the nation's young. In his State of the Union address, President Curtin had stressed the severity of the food shortage as the world population spiraled towards six billion. He called upon the young to exercise self-control in this crisis, but the sight of the fat, overfed president standing in living units across the country taking of du talking of duty and restraint had a negative effect on his audience, and the well-known fact that Curtin had fathered nine children made a showdown inevitable. At 9.30 p.m. Common Standard Time on Tuesday, March 3rd, in the year 2000, a 17-year-old from Charleston, Missouri, named Tommy Lee Congdon, was holding forth outside the Sheraton Bar. With firebrand intensity, he called upon his youthful listeners to follow him in a march on the White House. If you want to march, why don't you damn fool kids march home to bed, demanded a paunchy middle-aged heckler whose name is unrecorded. It was the wrong to wrong place, the wrong time, and the wrong mode of expression. Words and blows were heatedly exchanged. The little war had begun. By morning, half of Washington was in flames. Senators and congressmen were dragged in terror from their homes and hanged like criminals from trees and lampposts. The police and National Guard units were swept away in the first major wave of rioting. Buildings were set afire and explosive used. During the confusion, an attendant at the Washington Zoo released the animals to save them from the flames. The beasts were never recaptured. The army was called in and tanks were deployed on the streets radiating from the capital, but there were only a few older troops left to man them. The majority of the nation's armed forces were under the age of 21, and their sympathy lay with the rebels. They were ma there were massive defections from all the services. Abandoned uniforms were strewn along the length of Pennsylvania Avenue. The movement swept the states, but aside from the fighting in Washington, the revolution was remarkably bloodless. Angry young people took over state capitals, county seats, and city halls from coast to coast. Fearful for their lives, mayors and governors and city councilmen by the score deserted their posts, never to recover them again. Within two weeks, the reins of government lay firmly in the hands of youth. The little war had ended. During the rioting, Brigadier General Matthew Pope authorized the use of one vest pocket tactical atomic bomb. 
It was the last act of his life, and no other nuclear weapon was used in the little war. Ground zero for the bomb was the site of the Smithsonian Institution, and the resultant crater was thereafter known as Pope's Hole. It was a remarkably dirty bomb, and for two weeks Washington was virtually uninhabitable until the Geiger count fell low enough for observers to re-enter the city and test the atmosphere. Already the zoo animals had begun to breed. The next year marked the beginning of the great debates on how best to solve the population crisis. Cheney Mood had an answer. He was 16 and blessed with a ragged, powerful voice, glittering hypnotic eyes, and a sense of personal destiny. A crowd-pleaser, with the talent to make the commonplace sound novel and the preposterous seem reasonable. As proposal followed proposal, his voice rose above the others in a compelling thunder. His views found solid support. In London, at Piccadilly Circus, he addressed a chanting mob of 400,000 youngsters. In Paris, speaking flawless French, he mesmerized twice that number on the west bank of the Seine. In Berlin, they embraced him. Moon was the world's savior, the new messiah. Within six months, the followers of the Cheney Moon plan numbered in the millions. It was noted by detractors that most of his people were under 15, but what they lacked in maturity, they made up for in fanaticism. Five years later, the Moon Plan was inaugurated, and Cheney Moon, now 21, proved his dedication by becoming the first to publicly embrace sleep. Young America accepted this bold new method of self-control, and the thinker was programmed to enforce it. Eventually, all remaining older citizens were executed, and the first of the giant sleep shops went into full-time operation in Chicago. One thing the young were sure of, they would never again place their fate in the hands of an older generation. The age of government by computer began. The maximum age limit was imposed with the new system, and the original DS units were formed. By 2072, all the world was young. Logan squinted up the dark stairway. He did not delude himself. He was no match for Francis. The man was brilliant and unbeatable, an enemy to fear and respect, and he was somewhere up there ahead of them his black tunic blending into the shadows. Angerman was filled with fury, Homer in the gun. Looking at Jess, Logan felt sorrow. Behind the mask of fatigue, her face was beautiful, and she seemed so young. She'd lived a full life, yet she seemed so vulnerable and young. He waved Jess back into the tunnel gloom. She tried to protest. He hushed her lips. Then, smoke silent, he began ascending the stairs. At the landing, he slid stomach first against the stair riser, trying to make himself small. No sound above. He didn't expect any. Francis was a hunter. He'd wait until Logan was in his sights for a clean shot. Cautiously, Logan raised his heads. Still, nothing. He inched up the remaining flight of stairs, taking cover at every side of the entrance. He carefully eye-combed every inch of terrain. A swarm of gnats descended on him, but he did nothing about them. He did not move until he was positioned at positive that each leaf was a leaf, that each tree was, in fact, a tree, that each rock was made of stone instead of flesh. Then he moved. Logan plunged through the opening into a tangle of pulped vine, rolled several feet to come up behind the bulk of a rotting log. Again, he examined each feature of the surrounding area for an oddness, a stillness too still, a movement where none should be. Old Washington. Jungle and jungle sounds. A monkey chattered. A macaw screamed. Somewhere in the deep brush, a lion rumbled. Logan quartered the area surrounding the maze entrance. It was a choking riot of tropical growth. Giant banyans had shot out their root systems as they rose to make a foundation for other vines, ferns, and creepers. Exotic plants and flowers grew from the ripe low mulch next to spike thorn trees. Sword grass made it impossible to see into the jungle. It was a lunch confusion of dark green, sick green, yellow green. Underfoot, the ground bled rivulets of water, and pond lilies broke through the scum where dragonflies hovered and darted. He walked the area slowly. Frogs and snakes plopped and slid the area, slid away at his approach. Mosquitoes swarmed angrily, biting his arms and face. He was instantly mantled in sweat, and his shirt hung in the hothouse, damp again upon his shoulders, clinging to his chest and back. His trousers were wet to the knees before he had finished reconnoitering the area. Francis was not there. Logan returned to the tunnel's mouth. Jess, he called softly. The girl came up to join him. She looked about in wonder at the jungle. Heat from the nuclear explosion stored in tidal salts beneath the earth was still leaching out after all these years. The furnace heat combined with the high humidity had created a tropical rainforest, 
Winter ceased to exist in Washington. The site had once been a swamp, and to a swamp it had returned. Above the trees, they saw the sun-tinted dome of the Capitol building, and it seemed to Logan a logical place to head for in seeking Ballard. They moved off across the square into the thick of the jungle. Insects plagued them, buffalo flies and sweat bees, lesions of gnats and mites, spiders and ants. Spine trees slashed at their clothing. Needles from fishtail palms lanced at their skin. Twining poison vines entangled them, and the voice of the jungle was the voice of rhesus and chimp, of brush pig and plumed bird and razorback. Then another voice, rattling, belching, hollow, infinitely evil, the growl of a bengal, the jungle stilled, cat, breathed Logan, big one. The hair rose along the back of his neck. He probed the deep scars in his left arm as he remembered the black leopard. He'd been stalking lesser kudu at Bokov's in Nairobi. At Bokov's, the most famous of the great hunting restaurants, a man could escape the pallid food of the vending slots. He could hunt his own game with the knowledge that an expert chef stood ready to prepare a gourmet meal from the fresh-killed animal. It wasn't easy. Bokov had prided himself on the number of predators kept on the preserve. Anyone who wanted fresh game must run a proper risk to obtain it. He catered to the brave, and it was a mark of prowess to say, I dined at Bokov's. Logan had paid his fee, checked out a brace of weighted hunting knives, and entered the bush. He was careless, overconfident. The leopard had taken him by surprise. He remembered the black speed of it, the black savagery of it. He had almost died that afternoon. Logan and Jess did not stir. He held the gun, set it at Needler. A line of black ants marched steadily down his body from neck to elbow, making a trail of his right arm. Their home, a giant ant tree, brushed Logan's shoulder. But he did not move. Any sound at this moment, and the Bengal tiger, largest of his breed, might be upon them. The growl was closer. I think he's got our scent, Logan told the, told the girl. Stay behind me if he charges. A striped flame of yellow and black erupted from the high grasses. Logan fired. The needle slug buried itself in the Bengal's chest. He fired again, and a vapor cloud closed over the beast. The big cat twisted, stunned, growling murderously. The gas drove it back into the high brush brush. The growl faded behind them. When they reached the steps of the Capitol building, Jess was staggering. Her blouse was torn in a dozen places and the blood stained the cloth. Reddening welts discolored the girl's face. Logan helped her mount the crumbling steps, avoided the heavy tap roots which had split the stone. The mosquito drone followed them inside. The interior of the building was little better than the jungle which surrounded it. Vines had woven their intricate rope patterns throughout the chamber. Windows were shattered. The floor was root-pocked and damp with leaf mold. Jess slid down with her back to a section of the wall. Logan slipped down beside her. They didn't have to say anything to one another. Ballard was not here. Sanctuary was still illusion and fantasy. They closed their eyes, resting in the moist heat. Above them, an oiled glide of mottled copper. Twenty-three feet, five inches of dense muscle and crushing coil. Anaconda. The snake was hungry. It had not been satisfied with its last meal. The young ibex and two large rats had only wetted the, rat wetted the reptile's voracious appetite. Now its pebbled outer rid lids raised, and it considered the food below. The anaconda glided down through leaf stillness towards its dozing prey, lowering itself with shining stealth, tail anchored for leverage, gliding, lowering. Jess sighed, shifted her head to Logan's shoulder, leaned back. Through the gauze of her lashes, she noted the leaf branches above. One of the branches was unlike the others. One of the branches was moving. One of the branches was just screamed. They leaped out of the reptile's path as it struck at emptiness, coiling itself into a furious looped ball of writhing chain mail. He'd solve all our problems, said Logan as they headed for the steps. With him around, we wouldn't need to find Ballard. There were vultures on the cornice of the Senate building as they neared it. Four raw-necked buzzards peered down with gluttonous eyes as they passed beneath. Off in the jungle, something thrashed and died. The vultures flapped into motion. Jes Jessica shuddered. Ugly, she said. There's no place that's safe. Anywhere, near we anywhere we go, there'll be things waiting to kill us. Logan kept pushing ahead. 
Ballard has to be here somewhere. I know it. A ripe stench of hothouse peat moss, swamp water and decaying vegetation enveloped them as they crossed a wide stretch of the broken ground. Several Corinthian columns of white Georgia marble lay in their path. They moved through tumbled ruins. Here was a medley of styles, French, Roman, Renaissance, Classic Greek, gone to rubble. A trio of ionic pillars stood, stood miraculously upright, three smooth fingers probing the sky. Entablatures and architraves were woven with vine and creeper. Scrollwork, urns, garlands, lyres, sunburst designs emerged and disappeared in the lush growth. They didn't hear the soft pad of feet that tracked them relentlessly. They didn't see the sun-yellow, night-black beast that stalked among the fallen columns. They didn't see the bengal with cr the crimson smear on its chest. The evening sky darkened over Washington. Rain began to patter down. The patter became a roar. Rain punished the jungle, beating its way into the earth. Jessica's foot drove into thick mud as she tried to avoid a head-high growth of pampas blocking her path. Logan caught her arm, drawing her quickly back. Carefully, she, he parted the swamp grass. Cottonmouths, nest of them. In the dark pool, a knotted tangle of black snake bodies, blunt heads raised from the green slime with jaws widespread. The inside of each gaping mouth was white and cotton soft, except for two gleaming fangs that arched from the upper jaw in twin curved menace. They trudged on through the downpour. Ballard isn't here, said Jess. He can't be. No one can live in this place. Do you still believe he's here? Logan told her the truth. I don't know. They were in a field of high veldt grass, the old Union Station Plaza Arena. The rain was a solid silver sheet. Logan saw a flicker of wet gold in the grass. He tensed. Cat, he's back. Got our spore. He drew out the gun, checked it. A homer was useless on an animal, which meant he had only a tangler to fire at the beast. They moved off, and behind them the stalking bengal left its wake in the grass area. A single jacaranda tree rose from the veldt. Logan pushed his back against the grainy bark and pulled Jess to him. The tiger padded toward them. Above the grass, in a rain gloom, a light flickered on Capitol Hill. Logan's heart leapt. We found him. Ballard is up there. He pointed the huge bulk of Indiana limestone leaning against the scry. Library of Congress. I was right. I knew he'd go for high ground. The Bengal halted forty feet away. His yellow eyes burned from the veldt grass. He watched the two figures, hating them. As abruptly as it began, the rain stopped. They, alleged, they edged away from the jacaranda, keeping the bowl of the tree between them and the tawny cat. The grass tops discharged chaff that itched and stung their raw faces. Jessica's breathing was ragged. She'd been pushed to the edge of physical and mental endurance. How many others were like her, Logan wondered. Others ready to run and keep on running for life. The words of the woman on the concourse came back to him. Organized. By Ballard? He tried to recall when he'd first heard the name. Then he knew. It was the song. One of those folk chants sung to double guitar by dark minstrels and dim tobacco dens. Logan's nostrils were filled with nicotine odors as he remembered. He's lived a double lifetime, and Ballard is his name. He's lived a di double lifetime. Why can't we do the same? Ballard's lived a li double lifetime, and never felt no shame. Think of Ballard. Think of Ballard. Think of Ballard's name. The cat coughed. And that's where I'm going to end it for tonight.